So um, I'm going to explain a little bit about how to track animals inside the Guti. Um, so why would we track animals inside the Guti? Well, we need that for density estimation. So uh, the random encounter model, for example, for density estimation, uh, of which you will hear more later, it requires a couple of estimates, and two of them are the daily distance traveled. So how, what distance does an average individual of a certain species cover in a single day on average? And the second is uh, the size of the detection area. So the basically the angle and the distance uh, uh, of the area in which effectively animals are detected when they pass in front. If you know have these two ingredients, you can calculate the you can translate the photo rate. So how many how many visits per unit time you can translate that to a density estimate. That's and more about that later by someone else. So how do we get to this distance traveled? Well, basically, that's a, a multiplication of two other values. And the first is uh, the activity level. So the proportion of the day uh, uh, animals are are active. Um, and uh, that can be estimated from uh, basically the timestamps of the photos. This is a separate procedure and you don't need to do anything. It's just it's in inside your it's inside your data uh, by itself. And um, I'm not going to explain how it works, but it's a cool method, except if your species uh, is partially arboreal, but we don't have that problem in Europe. Oh, uh, well, maybe squirrels, but OK. Um, then uh, the second ingredient is the speed of animals while they are active. So not their average speed, including uh, sleeping time, but when they are active, uh, walking around, standing still, running, all that added up um, uh, is the speed while active. Um, uh, someone's waiting in the lobby. Yeah, somebody gave excess. OK. Um, so and that is the thing we try to estimate by tracking the path of animals through the camera view. I'll, I'll explain that later. And if you multiply those two things, the basically how much time and how fast during that time you get the distance traveled. Now, the second thing we want to know uh, for the random encounter model is the size of the detection area. And that we can estimate by recording the, the point of entry of animals into the camera view. So what is the position of the animal in the camera view when it was first detected? And if we have a whole bunch of those, we can estimate from that the effective detection area. So how is this done? I'm going to explain. Um, first, uh, though, uh, yeah, one thing I'm not going to explain here because I'm assuming that this is done uh, for you, um, but it's it's essential. So the point is the positions on the soil that you see in uh, camera trapping pictures. Uh, of course, they can be georeferenced, they can be given coordinates, but you need some sort of trick to do that. And that trick is basically making use of photogrammetry. If I'm saying this, I hope I say this correctly. And basically it requires two things and uh, you need to calibrate uh, the camera itself. So the, the, the piece of equipment. Um, and so what's the viewing angle and other properties of that camera? It's it's fixed. Uh, it needs so that calibration needs to be done just once for every camera model. And uh, you do that to using the, the manual that we have for this using known positions. You create a grid and since we all or most of us use the same camera model, this info needs to be provided centrally, and this will be the same. You select your camera model in Agouti, and then that info is added automatically. The thing that's not going to be added automatically, but that has to be done by you, is the calibration of the camera setting and view. So what is the camera seeing uh, in the place where you put it? And that needs to be done for each deployment separately, so for each place that you sample. And for that, we use the BART poles, and you that do that yourself during the camera setup or pickup. That's also explained in the manual. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, explain how you then process those photos once you have them. So uh, here we have a uh, here we have a uh, a photo, the first photo of a sequence, uh, including these. Uh, 
calibrate the calibration of the deployment. So it's usually the first bunch of photos that you have on your memory card. You upload them along with the uh, with the uh, the animal photos, and then the first one will be this. So here we see uh, Jim calibrating a deployment. Obviously, it's a deployment calibration. So I I tick this box here to say, hey, this sequence is a deployment calibration. And what then happens is that the uh, the uh, this uh, little menu that you see uh, in top will uh, will jump up, and there you fill out the actual height of the point that you're going to mark in the field. So the top of the stick here is at uh, it says here is at one meter, and then the bottom of the stick is at 0.2 meters. And if you know the distance, also the exact distance of the stick. Typically, you don't, but okay. If you do, then you uh, you add that uh, to the uh, to uh, the box as well. Now you can do that. Uh, so uh, so here's the, the lower one. And if you if you make a mistake, you do this just by clicking. And if you make a mistake, you can click the red uh, cross and then uh, redo it. It will disappear, and you can do it again. Now you do that for. Uh, uh, all the photos that you have in your calibration sequence. Here you see Jim moving around. And actually, we saw that Jim wasn't very careful here because he uh, he also has one here where the stick is not totally vertical. So this, this one you might skip. Then you just don't add any data huh? because the stick is, the, the photo is not usable. But the other ones are usable. And if you do that for enough of them, then uh, that will be uh, 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 that will be enough uh, to calibrate the view of the camera. So very important that the stick is uh, really on the ground and vertical, and that you assign the right points. It doesn't really matter which points. The most distant ones, like at zero meter and point uh, zero meter and one meter, it would be the most precise. But you could also use other ones. So that's for the deployment calibration. Now, once we have that, we uh, basically Aguti knows uh, or can know to what point, what coordinate uh, belongs to any point that you click in the photo. So it will assume that you click a point on the ground and that will have a coordinate. This means that we can record the movement path of animals by pinpointing the frontmost foot that is on the ground. If you would point the, to the nose, uh, Aguti will assume that you will uh, not uh, point to the nose, but point to some point uh, in the very, in very far away from the camera, behind on the ground behind the nose. So don't don't use any other body part. Use the foot. And we need the frontmost foot because that's the first foot that appears uh, in the view uh, of the camera. So this represents the place where the camera is being triggered. So you can do that as soon as you've added observations and you can only add uh, tracks to observations of single individuals. So if you want to track two individuals uh, separately, you have to add two observations of a single individual to a Guti, otherwise it won't work. If you add observation of, say, row deer two, it, it, then you can't track. You have to add two observations of one row deer separately. OK, so an example. So here is a here is a row deer. It's uh, you, you can. Do you see my mouse also? No, I don't think so. Um, how do I get that? We don't, we don't. Yeah. Rick, we do. Yeah. You do. OK, great. So here you see a row deer popping up. You see the eye. You see the uh, you see it's a male here. You see uh, the antler. You don't see the foot. So we could guess that the foot is here. Anyway, what we first want to do is add an observation. Um, what's that? And then uh, and after that, so first we add an observation an observation of one row deer. And then we can add a foot. So to make it easier, I actually made a mistake here. And the foot that I should have tagged is the one on the previous photo. But let's assume that this is the first photo, and then I do it correctly. Uh, you can also click a point outside of the photo. 
you just guess where the foot is. Uh, now this one I I is easier. So I click on the position of the foot and it will be recorded. And as I move through the sequence, uh, oh. I move through the sequence, I can add more points. And you see here, I actually uh, don't see the foot, so I can guess where it is, but I could also skip it. Likewise, I could skip it if the animal passes uh, and isn't moving and the foot is just remaining in the same place. And now, so, and I you can even add a point, uh, as you can see here, outside of the view. I have, to, I sort of guess where the uh, foot is just by, I can move the photo and add Whoa. one more point. Now, essentially, so, it, and I can then, I can do, go back and forth in the deployment and this track that we recorded remains. Now, uh, this is a track that is pretty straight. So here we could actually just have taken the first and the last that would have given us the distance traveled. I mean, it's a straight track. But um, if the track is more tortuous, so more bending, then it's very, or when there are pauses, it's more important that you also add the, uh, this, the intermediate steps. And these angles and step sizes uh, are by themselves interesting information, ecological information to record, and you can do stuff with that beyond the density estimation. So we recommend that you just add the complete track step by step uh, in which every point matters. And then you're done, you can save the observation. And this uh, row here will have a path uh, a, uh, assigned to it. So now the first point of this path is the point of entry. And if we have many such points, uh, that can then be used to calculate the detection area. And then the complete path, so from in this case point 1 to 11, measures the distance traveled. And if we divide that distance traveled to the duration of the photo burst, so the time, basically the difference in the timestamp between photo 11 and photo 1, uh, then we have the speed, the speed of this individual moving through this camera view. And many speed measurements combined can be used to calculate the average speed uh, while active. And, and that will, of course, differ greatly between running animals and, and foraging animals. So it's important that you select random sequences for this work and not say, oh, I only take the easy ones with um, animals uh, walking very slowly, because then we create a bias ag against fast moving individuals. So any individual that you can uh, assign a track to, even with just two or three points when it's running, add it, because otherwise the, the, the uh, average estimate of speed won't be accurate. Now, a couple of last points. So these estimates get more reliable as you take more measurements. Um, as a rule of thumb, you need like 25 or 50, maybe Marcus uh, knows this better, but this is my uh, rule of thumb per estimate. Now, what is an estimate? So the speed when animals are active, the detection area, and also the activity level differ between a couple of things. So first they differ between species. So you need separate estimates for every species. This is necessary because larger species, they move faster, they move longer distances per day uh, than small species. Uh, you need, if you have very different habitats like grasslands, open forest and very dense forest, you need also different estimates because in this denser habitats, the detection range will be shorter or animals will be moving more slowly because they might be foraging. Uh, it will be different. And then third, it may differ between seasons. So this doesn't matter much for our study because we are all working in a single season. But suppose that you combine winter and summer. Well, activity levels and movement speeds tend to be much lower during the winter because species try to conserve energy. So uh, you will need a different measurement for uh, that time. So for each combination, in our case, for each species habitat combination, 
we need separate estimates. OK, that was it. And um, happy to take questions. Thank you, Patrick, for that really practical presentation. Uh, yes, uh, any question, you can raise your hand. You can use the chat. Um, I read, you know, this is this is a little bit difficult because I have to. You can still meet, see my presentation, right? Uh, yes. OK. It's I can read the, the questions, uh, Patrick. Oh, uh, yeah, I can do that, but it's just a little. Okay. I need to show them on the second screen. OK, Okay. Uh, so Daniel asks, can you recommend a tolerance level when to redo the calibration because the camera can always move a bit during the project. Now, if your camera moves just a little bit, then, uh, well, that's just uh, a little bit of error. But if your camera moves a lot, basically you need a completely new uh, calibration and you would need to split your deployment in the two, basically the two positions. So for example, suppose that your camera is uh, positioned uh, nicely focused uh, on the horizon like you're told to do and then halfway like after two weeks uh, it suddenly um, tilts a little bit um, because it gets touched by an animal for example like a wild boar scratching the camera that happens um, yeah then basically your first calibration is longer no longer valid if you still want to use the photo so I wouldn't use any of the photos after that point for uh, calibration, only the ones before that point. But if you do want to use them, you would need a second calibration. And that would mean that you need to split the deployment into. I wouldn't do this. I would just say uh, uh, I use only for, for, for these measurements, I use only the photos before that point. Be careful though, because if, uh, so for example, if the camera tilts forward, Basically, your your detection zone uh, uh, is no longer the same. So, your yeah, uh, uh, your photos can no longer be used for reliable density estimation after that point. So, think out loud. I, you might want to throw out all the pictures after that point where the cameras the camera moved because simply you can't really use them anymore for density estimation. I hope this is clear, uh, uh, Danielle. OK, then uh, Oscar ask, uh, could be a great example with two different individuals in the same picture that we could do the next course. Uh, indeed, um, tracking two individuals in, uh, in, uh, in, in the same sequence uh, would be nice for this instruction. But I don't have that, sorry. Um, calibration with stick, uh, Jordi asks, is not available now. When do you think it will be? Uh, it is available. It is in there. You just need to click. You need just you just need to assign a species, an observation of a species with just one individual, and then you can go along. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, calibration with stick. Uh, yeah, it is available. As soon as you as you click if you as you click the slider, you uh, can uh, you can uh, use the uh, the calibration. And if not, uh, I don't understand why uh, you would need to write uh, a guti at ver.nl. Um, hope that's clear. And then Joanna asks, is there any data on comparison between the speed estimation obtained with the stick method and the human estimation looking at images? Um, a, a yes, there is. Um, and actually, I think Marcus are you are you listening? Um, the work that Ninke did is actually that, right? You and you're going to you're making a publication with that stuff. Is that including this kind of a comparison? Can you say something about this, Marcus? Um, yes, uh, it's not. Um, uh, that's not a comparison with human estimated movement paths. Um, we don't have that direct comparison, but yeah, we're working on a, a validation of the method where we look at the 
the um, degree of accuracy and the um, sources of errors. So the method will be refined over time as we as we learn more about it. But yeah, and that's actually what Joanna is hinting at. Can is this? Uh, how can we know for sure that this is the right? That these estimates are the right estimates? Yeah. Okay. Hope this answers your question, Joanna. Any more questions? I would have one. Uh, yeah, but the, the tape stick. So that's supposed to be perpendicular to the ground, right? But so in case the ground in front of the camera is not exactly flat, so you have part which might be flat in front and then it gets a bit of a, of a slope. So there, is it supposed to be perpendicular to the ground or vertical respect to the camera? It's a very good question. So if you if you have a place that is a, has a slope, uh, it's fine to put the camera there. But if you if you have a place that is flat and then a slope, all within the range, then this is not a really good place for this method. You need something that is. It doesn't need to be level, but it needs to be uh, a plane at least, and and no, not too hilly, um, uh, because only then the uh, the geo referencing of the uh, of the images, so the the calibration works, and and uh, and that being said, for the camera calibration, so the stuff that happens just once for each model, not the deployment calibration, but the camera calibration, you need something that's perfectly flat. Um, so you could even do it in a room or uh, on a parking lot, so it doesn't matter. But the ones in the forest obviously are never perfectly flat, um, and you try to make the best of that. Just, just the second part of your question was whether how to put the stick. Well, you aim your camera uh, parallel to the to the ground. So if the slope is down, you aim your camera down as well, and then the sticks are completely perpendicular to the slope. So uh, if it's perfectly horizontal, of course, it's a no brainer. But if you have a slope uh, down, then the I'm not sure. Can you see me uh, while I'm yeah. just OK? Then the sticks are perpendicular to it. So not vertical, but perpendicular to the slope. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the camera is too. The camera should also be parallel to the slope. No, no, that's clear. No, my only doubt was when the the ground level somehow changes. So when it's first flat, but you you kind of answered to it. But so yeah, when when, it's, when, when, when it's, it changes, uh, should I still put any vertical respect to the camera or follow the the being perpendicular to the ground and not anymore to the camera? But no, so, the, 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 the key is perpendicular to the camera. So it. it so the, the the orientation to the ground depends on how you set the camera. So I always find it easier to and um, keep in mind how the camera is facing. So if the camera is facing this way, then your stick is like this. But if it's pointing down to catch the slope, then the stick is perpendicular to the camera. Keep keep that keep that in mind. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah. Now there's another the question. Line of sight, that is. There's another question in the chat by Stoyan. He asks if the, an animal is too close to the camera and you don't have an idea where the footsteps on the ground are, should you exclude it from the distance estimation? Um, now, that's a very tricky question. <laughs> Marcus, uh, we can't do any tracking of the, of the, uh, of the path, but we, don't, we do want to, we do want to, Estimate it. We do need it for the the uh, for the detection area. How would yeah, you do so, it, uh, Marcus? Yeah. So so um, I I would I would make a, a a guess. It may be it may be a long way outside the um the the, the image actually. So um, you may need to move the image a long way to get to the point you need to digitize. But it's important to have that. It's um, when you get to um, position very close to the camera. It's the estimations are not so sensitive to that, so you can have very big, um, a, a very big variation in where you choose to digitize it, and it won't make much difference to the, the the estimated distance. So it's not 
it's not a it's not a huge problem in fact um the fact that you can't actually see the feet it's still worth and um, important to um, have those points digitized yeah that being said we wouldn't want to use that one for the complete track because just for the first point right so uh when it comes to animals moving and forgetting the speed um you you can basically you basically can focus on only the animals that move at some distance from the camera so you can see at least a substantial portion of of their track uh, yeah so, so yeah. there you would not use the ones very close to the camera but for d you do get the first point of every photo close to the camera exactly. even if it's so, just a crude estimate so the so the practical implication of that is that if you have a sequence which runs very close to the camera <clears throat> you would still digitize the first position but not the subsequent ones exactly is this clear uh, stoyan and other people uh, yes i'm just writing yes I, I understood thank you very much okay and then valerie asked do you have any experience in using the shoulder of the animal instead of the foot well the problem if if you do that um you Actually, not the, the program won't think that you point at the shoulder. It will think that you point at the soil very behind the shoulder, which will be very far away. Um, so the only way to nail the animal to the ground is to point uh, to the if to, to point to something that touches the ground. And there is there is no other way. If you would want to use the nose or the shoulder. You would put need to put the camera in the in the air. Uh, you would need to put it like five meters high and facing down. And actually, this is what we do in a project in Nepal. But I uh, well, that's easy for the processing, but it's not easy for the deployment. So I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, so this is why we really have to work with the foot, and we need to first the frontmost foot because that's the point that we need for the detection area. I hope that's that's clear. So don't swap to noses or ears or shoulders. It won't work. Um, I hope this is clear, Valerie. OK, yes. And then Amy asks, out of interest, can anyone recommend some software that can convert a screenshot from a camera video footage to photos? Well, that's well, if you know the answer, please add it to the chat. I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I have a tool, but not specifically for uh, for camera vi for video. Uh, but I understand that you asked this question because you actually have videos and you want to turn those into photos. Is this why you asked this, uh, Amy? And then process the photos with uh, um, yes. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm just kind of dialing in just um, yeah, out of interest. But yeah, we have a, a lot of um, video footage on badges and I'd like to kind of convert some of the video to, to uh, photos. OK, well, uh, don't do this. Um, <laughs> um, so, well, if you have the choice, use photos. I mean, photos are not so nice for demonstration purposes, but this is this works better for uh, for uh, for the camera trapping analysis. Mm -hmm. If you have videos, well, Aguti can also deal with video, so you can actually upload the videos. I never did that, but uh, it's possible. The problem is that um, there's no standardization of EXIF data of videos, so you can't actually get, you can't really pull the time, dates and times uh, uh, from the videos automatically. You need to enter those <laughs> manually, and that's a so that makes it very cumbersome. Uh, mm -hmm. But suppose that you would convert them to photos, you would still have the same problem that they don't have a timestamp uh, that you could automatically uh, enter, and then it becomes very cumbersome. So okay, if you want to know you. about importing video, please contact uh, Aguti for, for help. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. And then uh, Fre Friedrich asks, um, if you look down the riverbank, like for others, um, is the angle is the angle enough to calculate with? And we still use the sticks. 
OK. Yeah, I, if you if the if you imagine that the water level is the ground level, uh, it's the same. Yeah, that would could work. But uh, I guess you're not asking that for this particular project, but just for more in general. So uh, yes, you, you would then imagine that the water level, so the top level of the water is zero and, and just hold the calibration stick above the water. Just, well, just, just touching the water. Hope this is clear, Friederike. Yes, okay. And then one more question by, oh, uh, that's not the question. It's Marcus says, he has uh, scrappy R functions. Uh, so Amy, that might help you to extract frames from video. All right. Any more? Yeah, there's, there's still some hands up. Um, yes. Oh, sorry, I can't see those. Uh, I will start by my own yes. question. Where then the other one. Where is Pablo? I think yeah. Lars is the first one. Lars is the first one, I guess. Lars. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I just wondered about this deployment calibration, how you use this. I mean, the height of, uh, I understand this, uh, you show very good the uh, Patrick about the, the road they're moving there, and I can understand how to calculate the distance uh, and uh, the speed. And to, uh, I think, I guess then one put this into this formula to calculate this uh, density, for example. Uh, but what is the use of this height? I mean, this 20 centimeters, the, the stick, how, how is that used in this uh, okay. sense? So uh, basically, you know, you know that distance, uh, then uh, if you know the dimensions of the stick by saying, OK, this is zero and this is one meter, um, and you know the uh, viewing angle of the camera, the model, so the, the lens angle, you can calculate where the stick is. Mm -hmm. So you okay. move that stick around uh, yeah. through yeah. the view, and basically from these two positions, the the algorithm can estimate whether the whether the stick is far away or close, and mm -hmm. more even, it can estimate the exact distance. And if you know that distance because you you do additional measurements, then uh, you can you you can of course position that further. Uh, but the idea is that by ju just moving the stick around and providing the dimensions of the stick by entering these numbers tells the computer the view of the camera. It can tell, okay, this is this is the depth that I see here uh, in the picture. Um, that's essentially it. Okay, so, so for these photos, you always enter the uh, you enter the distance and the height. And you or... you you know you enter the you need to the things the two things that you need to enter is uh, a low point on the stick, like zero or twenty centimeters above the ground ah, yeah, on the yeah. stick. That's why you need to stick with bars and mm -hmm. uh, somewhere at the top. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. the larger that difference, the more uh, power the calculation has. Um, so if you would say, oh, this is 20 centimeter and this is 30 centimeter, well, that wouldn't be much worth for uh, for the computer. But if it's if you say I do zero centimeter and uh, 100 centimeter, yeah. then uh, it has more power. OK, OK. I hope I expl explained this correctly, Marcus. <laughs> the, I, I think the bit that's missing is once the, the model knows how far each stick is, then it creates a map that um, links each pixel position to a real world ground position. So that means that we can point at any pixel in the image when we're digitizing the animal position, and we can calculate um, the position of that animal in the real world. And then we can get the, the movement paths and um, positions for um, detection zone modeling. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, just I I did use a, a stick, a very big uh, uh, stick that we have bought for another project that says each centimeter. So I didn't use this round things, but uh, I, I guess that it doesn't matter because I will show see on the picture 
This yeah. is one meter, this is 1.5 meters, etc. So suppose that you have a stick. Uh, it's exactly one meter tall and you don't have the bars on it. It's just a stick. Then you would always use the lower part, the zero, and the top part, the 100 centimeters. The problem because that's that. the only dimensions that you know. Except but if you that. have bars, you can also use other other heights. It's important to have the bars because nine times out of 10, we can't see where the stick touches the ground. So that's true. Yeah, um, it will be it will be very error prone if you try and digitize the bottom of the stick where it touches the ground. Maybe it would have worked in the example that I showed with the in the beach horse where there's a Maybe. where there's thin litter and there's no no vegetation. But uh, yeah, OK, yeah. And um, uh, where I is, where's the more oh, Pablo ask a question? OK, thank you. Um... I would like to clarify one point regarding the early first question from Daniel, uh, because what we already said in the previous course of the observatory is to calibrate the camera deployment when we set the camera and then when we come back uh, one month later to check the batteries or whatever to repeat the calibration with the pole. So at this point, all of our collaborators of all the participants will have actually more than two calibration for each camera. So because if we set the camera today, we did the calibration with the balls one month later before checking the memory card or the batteries or whatever, repeat the calibration. After, check on, after checking the memory cards and so on, repeat the calibration and so on. So then, uh, I mean, we propose this uh, time consuming maybe approach in order to optimize and don't discard uh, those empty photos. Uh, in case that the camera is for any reason, for an uh, animal moves the camera or we move the camera or we're changing the batteries and so on. Okay. So, so the then second, in this case. The second set of calibration photos is just ba basically for security in case something happens or if the first mm -hmm. one failed. Yeah, exactly. Or, or if yeah, the camera right. moves, it enables you to. Exactly. I mean, I think, I yeah. think that's, I, I, I think that's good, good practice to have additional calibration photos for at any point if you're checking for sure because the camera will almost certainly move if you open the um yeah. open it to change batteries um if uh maybe um there's a movement at some point halfway through that deployment then it's it's worth having the additional calibration images at the end when you collect the camera as well that way you can if you have you have one deployment in principle but for the purposes of um tracking animals, you, you, you're going to want several deployment models applied to different images. Um, and, and that can be done in principle. I, I need to look at how Agouti will um, organize the data to enable that. Um, but uh, it, I think it's good good practice because it enables you to use more of the data. For, for Agouti, I can answer, you, you will have to um, split the deployment in two deployments. Um, because otherwise, it, so you can only for each deployment, you can only have one calibration. So if yeah. imagine you, you do the calibration with the sticks at the beginning, and then you see that after 10 days, a wild ball bumped into the camera, moved it, and then you have again a calibration at the end, then you would have to split it up like the first set of images till the moment. The problem will be afterwards that it will be um, like a half a deployment or two deployments of which is one of two weeks, three weeks, and the other one shorter. But that's an, a, a data treatment um, yeah. problem. It's fixable, I'm sure. Yeah, the, the, but you will have to do it manually, split the deployment in two deployments by uploading them in a Um I, I had a question from, from Marcus and, and Patrick also. Is um, I'm a little bit puzzled with the fact of moving around the images <laughs> um, when you then click on points which are out of the, out of the picture. Um, because for me, it's really a little bit puzzling and unclear what really happens. If I move the picture and then I click, is the computer knowing where the center of my moved picture went through or what is going on? Because I'm still in the screen of Agouti, but the image has been moved out of the screen. So it's a little bit funny. And I have the same question. At the moment, you can zoom in and zoom out um, very easy in Agouti. But if I zoom in to click on the right position for the, the bars on the stick, of course, all of a sudden they are on a completely different place 
as when I did not move or did not zoom in the image. So just to get it clear, are you allowed to move pictures and to zoom in, zoom out? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Six, to calibrate because, the six also, because if you zoom in, then the distance, I mean, no becomes different. So I don't know what happens. Let's put it Nothing happens because uh, basically you point to a pixel and the pixel has a coordinate. And uh, if you if you if you zoom in on that pixel, we'll still have the same coordinate. Yeah, and uh, when you when you move when you move the photo and and uh, point to uh, an imaginary pixel outside of the uh, outside of the photo, it's basically an imaginary pixel with coordinates, same thing. So you can do that. Yeah, you can zoom, you can move, it will work. So he's not using the box to decide the pixels, but he's using the image to decide the pixels. But if he's, because if he's using the box in Aguti to decide where you are, I mean. No, the pixels, it's using, it's using, using the pixels. The yeah. 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 Each pixel gets associated with a ground coordinate that's in this picture. And it, and then that will be a ground coordinate even if a, if the nose of a deer yeah, is in front that, of that's it. That's clear for me. I, I was just wondering because, I mean, in fact, you, zoom, you can also zoom in, zoom out by the browser by using Control plus Control min. So everything is changing all the time. So um, I, I'm not sure. Um, but maybe it's a too technical discussion, which we have to discuss with Yorick and Ramon. What happens if people start to combine zooming of a picture, zooming of the browser, moving everything around, how Aguti still knows why you're clicking? Because in fact, you're clicking on a screen and you're not clicking on the image. So this is quite some, uh, for me, it's quite puzzling to it's, see what like, happens. But if you guarantee it's OK, then we will do it. it. Yeah, no, I mean, it can. So so as Patrick said, if you zoom, up, zoom in on a pixel or move it around, if you're pointing at that pixel, it's still that pixel. So so that, that it, that's on the image. If you click off the image, it's simply a question of extrapolating the, 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 um, the pixel map in the computer brain away from that. So you could imagine the, you know, the pixels go from naught to 2000 or something, but you can just extend that indefinitely in, in space beyond that. So they, it just uh, it just has that imaginary pixel map going on beyond the image, essentially. Yeah, but you still have to be on the Aguti screen, I suppose. I mean, I have two screens yeah. on my computer. If I move to the next screen and I click somewhere in the middle of a, a landscape, he's still calculating this as being a good no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, it has to be with. So I see two more questions, but uh, and it's already really late. So I hope that these are the last two. Lexo, uh, and and the last one is Pablo. Lexo. Um, um, Patrick, thanks for our interesting um, uh, explanations. Uh, my question is about um, uh, uh, the deployment calibration, where you have uh, eight sticks with no bars. At certain distances, like 2.5, 10, um, and the tapes, like bar tapes, police tapes. That's the protocol we, we have followed. Uh, how do you deal with this data then? How do you uh, make it to Aguti? Uh, so you, it sounds as if you use the camera calibration protocol to calibrate the deployments. Is this, is this what you're saying? No, we did this. Uh, we followed this uh, second instruction, yes, which, uh, uh, which calls for these eight sticks. Uh, yeah. It's like a triangle. It, we create a triangle with this thing. Not, I guess a diamond, kind of diamond, uh, in this um, um, the the range within the range of the camera vision. Uh, and you have this, uh, you basically have this horizontal distances to do those sticks already. Uh, so you, you are referring to the previous uh, to the previous protocol. So in this case, if you mm -hmm. did not use the stick with a 20 centimeter mark, then uh, uh, you must uh, process the images manually. Because the, in this case, the reference is just uh, the the distance in in, in the uh, blank picture, right? So in the, in the next presentation after the break, uh, Paolo is going to to go into details of this protocol. Oh, great! Thanks. 
Okay, and Pablo, finally. Yeah, I would like to share my screen if it is possible to discuss one example with you, Patrick and Marcus. Sure. Yeah. So. Okay, I guess that now you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Uh, so in this maybe difficult example, uh, I mean, as you can see, uh, we have two slopes actually. So one from the right side of my screen of the photo to the left. And also from the, I mean, the camera I set in in the up part of a hill or of a mountain. So then we also have a, another slope to the bottom of the valley. Um, and we always say that we have to set the camera perpendicular to the slope, but here we actually have two slopes. So it's impossible to set the camera to perpendicular to both slopes. So uh, regarding the calibration, how we should set the the calibration pole like in the uh, pink one in this way so perpendicular to the up to the bottom slope or uh, sorry perpendicular to the uh, right side to the left side of the picture or in the yellow one because uh, i mean so, uh, yeah um in that axis so the 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 so um so you've got the camera line of sight. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at my camera. The camera's coming through that. So the the, the poles are pivoting in in the that axis. In fact, um, it doesn't matter what angle you use for the pole in that axis. The key one is if you, the pole pole is pointing away from or towards the the camera line of sight. That, that that's a problem if the if it's pivoted in in that axis away from towards the camera. So the pole needs to be perpendicular to the line of sight of, of the camera, more or less. That's the key thing. I mean, but then uh, in one of the slides of Patrick, they say that in the example with the pole with Jim, it's not useful because the pole was slightly. Ah, yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I don't to... find the difference. I meant to comment on that. I I I think I think that's um sorry Patrick, I think that's not that's not such an issue, in fact. Maybe I'm uh, being too precise. <laughs> yeah. My point is you need you need uh the sticks need to base basically be all the same, be it like this or no, like no, this. No, no, they don't no no in in this axis, in the, the axis um I can't I can't find the words to describe it, but I ho hopefully you see what I mean. If the pole is yeah. ro rotating in that axis, they can be in any orientation. It doesn't matter. So that the pink one and the yellow one are both fine. You could use them both. OK, um, it's just. Oh, really OK, I get it. I didn't know that. So I've been doing my best to keep the stick straight for nothing. Yeah. Uh, well, you do need to keep it straight, but in, in a different axis in the, the forward back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Relative yeah. to the line of sight of the Got camera. it. Got it. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, for sure. 